Curtis Wright Created in a merger of a dozen companies, it was the amalgamation of the Curtis Airplane and Motor Company family with those companies affiliated with Wright Aeronautical. Still in business, producing components, Curtis Wright is one of the greatest aircraft and power plant companies the United States has ever seen. Working from their offices, plants, and airport in the Caldwells, New Jersey, Curtis Wright was a legend in American aviation from the beginning. In the 1930s, the various Curtis subsidiaries were an arsenal for the world, well before the phrase arsenal of democracy was ever uttered. One country in desperate need of such an arsenal was the Republic of China. The warlord period came to a practical end with the rise of the KMT, only for peace to be robbed from them in the constant conflicts with Japan that manifest in the loss of Manchuria, Hebei, and Mongolia, and eventually the full-scale warfare that commenced in July of 1937. The first major air confrontation would commence only two weeks after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, when the Chinese Air Force's Curtis Hawk II and Threes and Boeing P-26 P shooters cost the Japanese Naval Air Force half the carrier-based aircraft and G-3M Nell bombers sent to destroy them in a mere three days of battle. From the very start, Curtis's planes and China's fate were inseparable. Curtis had a long history of providing aircraft for export to China. The Model 35 Hawk II and the subsequent Model 68C Hawk III had been the backbone of the Republic of China Air Force in the 1930s. These were the export versions of the U.S. Navy's XF-11C2 and BF-2C1, respectively. Curtis later supplied the Hawk 75H and Hawk 75M variants of the P-36 Mohawk and, perhaps most famously, the Model 81A 2 and 3 of the P-40 Warhawk. However, these were all designed for the domestic market, with the export market as a secondary but crucial customer base. The exception to this is the largely forgotten interceptor designed almost specifically for export to a besieged China, the Curtis Wright CW-21. This is her story. This is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Welcome back. I know it's been quite a long time since I've had a video out. I really want to thank all of you for your patience, your support. You know, last of all, I want to thank YouTube, who's without their algorithm and their copyright strikes and everything else, would have made it impossible to be this far delayed in releasing a video. Regardless, welcome to an episode I know many of you have awaited for quite some time. I started working on the research back in November. It is currently August, and uh, most of the audio and video took months to get together. The records were very difficult to find, so. I'm grateful to all of you, not only for keeping engagement up, but also for encouraging me to complete this and really make it one of my long subject, hopefully, masterpieces. So, moving on. Inseparable from the story of the CW21 is the influence of ladies' man, man's man, man about town, entrepreneur, spy, anti prohibition activist, pleasure seeker, CIA agent almost father-in-law to Liz Taylor, and man you need around if you decided to throw a coup and nobody came, William D. Pauley. Pauley is usually best remembered for his role in supplying the American volunteer group with everything from soup to nuts, especially in the form of money. He'd been doing this for years for Curtis, starting in South America. He had the money, the influence, and the charisma to work deals above the table, under the table, and nowhere in the proximity of anyone who has ever seen said table and he can't prove they did in a court of law. Growing up in Guantanamo Bay, his nickname Cuba followed him throughout his career. He started his own company at the age of 18, selling diving suits to Venezuelan pearl divers in 1914. He drove a milk float, sold Florida real estate. He was sharp. The FDR library has a whole pile of papers on him. I'm going to put the link in the description. His life went from investment bonds to James Bond and all in between. In the Great War, he sold old Haitian ships to the U.S. government. He amassed a considerable fortune, and by the 30s, he was a name to be known. He founded the China National Aviation Corporation, the first commercial airline to achieve sustainability in Asia. That was in 1929. And in the early 30s, he started the Nacional Cubana de Aviación Curtis, 
which was the Cuban National Airline, specifically under the umbrella of Curtis, then sold it to Juan Tripp's Pan Am and made an absolute fortune. Your man did the same there with a Sperry owned subsidiary that he ran as part of his pet China National Aviation Corporation, selling that portion of his own company to Tripp, still maintaining control over the remainder, and then selling that remainder to Pan Am in a separate transaction. Remaining connected to CNAC and still hawking Curtis goods in China, he was beyond a wealthy man. Curtis definitely could not function through this time without him. He made over $30 million for Curtis while he was in China. And that's only what Curtis had. In the White House papers, his own fortune was called substantial. And that's only the fortune that they knew about. His ability to funnel arms to where they were needed included overcoming the two-year-long federal lawsuit against Curtis Wright that began with FDR's 1934 orders limiting arms exports to those arenas deemed in accord with national foreign policy as directed by and enforced through the executive branch. At that time, Pauli and Curtis were shuttling arms to the Chaco War, packing weapons in crates of warplanes to hide them when neither should have been going down the South America way. So Pauli's usual cut was 10% of the value of goods sold, plus whatever he earned through his own connections. And these were in countries where severe corruption would be an improvement from unbelievable levels of corruption and even more from playing the market in what was whatever you'd call worse than insider trading. In the Chaco War, he was Curtis's man for setting up dummy airlines to sell allegedly demilitarized bombers. They were also selling allegedly civilian aircraft, in which were packed alleged machine guns, ammunition, and explosives, definitely illegal. And they were selling Bolivia all sorts of this stuff. Uh, That was both before Congress found out, when Congress found out, and definitely after Congress found out. Pauli and Curtis were pushing the limits. But in 1937, when Japan and China were again in full-flung war, there was a clear difference. China's fight against Japan was, it seems, in line with American interests. Congress was not going to do much to keep Curtis and Pauli from doing what they could to protect American interests in China and help the Chinese keep the Japanese at bay. And if not, well, then Curtis and Polly would just go there and build their own Curtis. It's Blackjack and hookers. Maybe. Sounds like him. Now, back in the 30s, he was already well engaged in China, as I mentioned. He was politically savvy. He was cunning. He was active in every field of politics you could imagine. And although he was a devoted and loyal Republican, he hung around with FDR, was friendly with Churchill, was a key man in the Truman administration, and even earned the Medal for Merit from Truman in '46. helped him found the CIA, palled around with the Kennedys, was known around Hollywood, and was one of the first to warn America about communist rumblings in South America supported by Muscovite rubles, and one of the first to do something about it. One of the wealthiest men in the world, Pauli also worked hard for his country for decades and was influential as Truman's ambassador to Peru, where he secured mining rights, as ambassador to Brazil, where he played matchmaker for Standard Oil, and he acted in one of the most important roles in the coup in Guatemala that restored anti-communist government in the form of the appropriately mustached strongman Carlos Castillo Armas. He battled for Batista, made Cuba Libres for Bobby Kennedy, supported helicopter rides for Latin leftists, and helped cultivate the garden at Langley and the men that led American intelligence through the 70s and 80s. He was funneling money from Vice President Nixon to a certain group of Cubans dedicated to ending a certain cigar-smoking former baseball player, then helping channel American dollars to some others who took it for a little trip to the Bay of Pigs, all while arguing and partying with the Kennedys. Pauli's life, as you can see, was an often contradictory one, but definitely an interesting one, and I mean, I think that's a definite understatement. And as he began to say before, it was really in China that he first started to come into his own. In the 30s, he became a real national asset. After founding the China National Aviation Corporation and the Central Aircraft Manufacturing Company, he humbly established his modest self at this newly constructed little place called 30 Rockefeller Plaza in Manhattan. With the aid and vast wealth of Madame Chang's brother, T.V. Song, Pauli soon recruited a certain pal of his, Claire Chenault. It was he who offered Chenault and his expertise to Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. In time, Pauli's money also bought the pilots needed to make up the AVG. But first, China needed planes, 
Curtis knew how to build them, and Polly knew how this could make him loads of money. And for truth, justice, the American way, of course, just as he was for his whole life. And I shouldn't say that with any sarcasm. That really was how this man operated. Starting in 1933, Pauli's Central Aircraft Manufacturing Company at Chenchao Air Base in Hongchao, now known as the Hangzhou Chenchao Air Base and Airport, provided the aircraft needed to fight the encroaching Japanese. In the early years after the Japanese incursions, over 100 Hawk 2 and Hawk 3 aircraft were built there from Curtis factory supplied kits. As the Japanese advanced, Camco moved inland to Hangzhou, then to Hangzhou with a secondary facility established at Loi Wing, near Wili City, only scant miles from the Burmese border near Pangsang, where it could easily be supplied by the Burma Road. Pauli's influence and capacity to operate in increasingly foreboding scenarios were immeasurable. It would be at Loi Wing, also known as uh, Lei Yun, that the AVG would find their repair and resupply facilities on many occasions, and where aircraft coming over the border would be assembled. The facilities, as you can see here, were sparse, but they had the best of engineering minds that semi-legitimate money could buy. A repair shed, open plan construction hangars, and comfortable housing for both Chinese and American staff were all erected in short order. Between July of 1939 and the massive Japanese bombing raid of 26 October 1940, three Hawk 3s, 30 Hawk 75s, 30 Kurdish trainers, 29 P-40B Warhawks, three DC-3s, eight Blanca traders, and four beachcrafts for coastal patrol would be built there. Also, one heavily damaged Sikorsky amphibian was rebuilt almost from scratch. And after October 1940, with the place in a shambles, many, many P-40Bs were built or repaired. And that's only what we know about. At the Loy Wing facility, there was also to be found this little interceptor that Bill Pauley had been pushing for Curtis to develop, just for his favorite little generalissimo, and for which the Chinese Air Force was waiting with bated breath. The Curtis Wright CW-21 Interceptor. So why was such a craft needed, and why wasn't one already on the drawing board? To answer this question, there are three angles that really need to be explored. Japan, China, and the politics of the American Army Air Corps, which includes, of course, a certain Claire Chenault, and our favorite little commie-bashing James Bond economist cum political wise guy that we've been talking about. But for now, let's just take a minute to get an overview of the Japanese air forces in China between 1937 and 1940 to really get a grasp of the situation and why having an interceptor was an absolute necessity for China in those years. At this time, the Japanese themselves were going through major changes. Up until 1937, the Japanese Army and Navy were biplane equipped and limited in their capacity to assist in the grueling land campaigns. While the Navy had adopted the Mitsubishi A5M Claude in 1937, the Army lagged slowly behind. The Japanese Army Air Service only began to replace the Kawasaki Ki-10, later known as the Perry, with the Nakajima Ki-27 Nate in spring of 1938. Before the Ki-10 Perry, Japanese Army fighters were a pretty pathetic lot, and whilst the Ki-10 was a significant improvement, it just wasn't good enough. Old designs continued in Japanese use as well, and this is something that kind of cursed the Japanese all through to 1945. Richard Voigt's Type 92 Army fighter, also called the Kawasaki KDA-5, was just a mess. Likewise, the Type 88 light bomber, seen behind the Type 92 wet noodle, was used from 1929 to 1938, and was indeed like taking a Q-tip to a gunfight. The Perry, designed by famed creator Takeo Doi, uh, Richard Voigt's disciple at Kawasaki, was obsolete, and most airframes had seen more than their share of action. The 1935 biplane fighter could barely hold her own against the Chinese Curtis Hawk 2s and Hawk 3s, and she stood no chance against any new aircraft entering the fray, especially after Soviet support started streaming in after 1937. She would serve until replaced by the Nate in March 1938, lingered on for a little bit longer, and then was sent to training and differential training units. Unfortunately, little survives in terms of footage of the war in China. 
The parry is an exception, thanks to Japanese propaganda movies. Here, the parry and the nate can both be seen. The nates are escorting Sally bombers, which we'll get to in a minute, and the parries are being used to depict the Chinese biplane fighters. Now, the Ki-27 nate was a modern fighter in most ways. However, she lacked a retractable undercarriage, armor, or any improvement in armament over the pair of rifle-caliber machine guns. Whilst those pair of machine guns had made up the armament of most 1920s fighters, by 1938, she was severely underarmed. The Nate had a range of 380 miles, or 680 miles, with the twin 133-liter streamlined auxiliary tanks, and it was 20 miles an hour faster than the Claude, peaking at 290 miles an hour and cruising at 220. Thanks to an enclosed cockpit and a 40,000-foot ceiling that was slightly better than the Claude's 36,000, the Nate was in some ways better suited than the Claude to the high plateaus and mountains that defined the Chinese mainland. The Navy's Claude was designed by the brilliant Jiro Horikoshi, and she was a better machine than most Chinese fighters like the Hawk III, and was on par with the Boeing P-26 in Chinese service. It was the size of China and the disparate ranges of pursued aircraft and bombers that really saved China in this time. Used alongside other carrier-based aircraft, like these Aichi D-1A2 Suzy dive bombers, the Claude's range and speed were not an issue at first. With the introduction of strategic overland campaigns, it would not be until the drop tank-equipped A5M4 variant of the Claude entered service that range increased to 750 miles thanks to the inclusion of a drop tank. She finally became more worthwhile for overland and land-based service. The early models of the Claude could barely reach 240 miles per hour at altitude, but she was known to be a rugged, agile, and competent, albeit underarmed, aircraft. And when she faced off against Soviet aircraft at Kalkengol, which also marked the first use of naval fighters as part of a land campaign, it was this armament that held her back from being able to really secure the air war in Japan's favor. Like the Nate, she had a pair of 7.7mm guns, and was nimble and modern when compared to what China was fielding when she arrived on the field of battle. It was her poor armor that led her to being vulnerable to Soviet fighters and ground fire over Mongolian skies. Japan's antiquated slow bombers hindered their performance by demanding heavy escort to survive against an increasingly modern Chinese air force. By 1940, both the Nate and the Claude found themselves at the limits of their performance, and falling behind contemporaries such as the F-2A Buffalo and P-36 Mohawk, let alone the Hawker Hurricane, Supermarine Spitfire, and BF-109, which were all fighting at that very moment for Britain's survival, to offer a comparison of the Pacific versus European theaters in terms of technology. Now, in terms of bombers in these last years of the 1930s, by 1938, the Japanese Army Air Force was introducing their own Mitsubishi Ki-21 Sallies, where the Italian-made Fiat BR-20 Cicogna had been filling the role of a long-range medium bomber that the stupidly antiquated Ki-1 and Ki-20 could not meet. Now, when I say stupidly antiquated, I'm being polite. The Ki-1 was made from 1933 to 1936 and was based on the 1927-designed Junkers K-37. She still served up through 1937. Barely reached 140 miles per hour and had a ceiling of a mere 16,000 feet. Yet here it appears in a brief scene from the Japanese film Fighting Soldiers. I can't find footage of the light bomber derived from the same design, the Mitsubishi Ki-2, but she was in Manchuria in China and could be taken out by a thimble and a rubber band on a lucky day, just as much the Ki-1. She carried a bomb load of only 660 pounds, or 1,100 pounds depending on layout, and was slow and just incredibly odd. One can see why, leading up to the late 30s, an interceptor was just not exactly on a priorities list. When they arrived, the Italian BR-20s were a welcome sight, although the Japanese had no idea how to use Italian technology. For example, they didn't know that the engines used 75% power for crews rather than the two-thirds that Japanese engines used. They didn't know how to maintain those engines properly. The generous instrument panels absolutely confused them. And they never learned how to employ the features that were new to them, instead just choosing to use them as if they were Japanese planes. 
The Japanese press blamed the weak fabric skin of European planes for their failures, but the BR-20 had metal-skinned wings. It was anything but the Japanese fault that they had no idea how to use these aircraft, so they just ran them into the ground. The 82 examples were used from 1938 to 1939, mostly without fighter cover, at slower cruising speeds than those at which they were designed to operate, and with ill-trained crews. It took time for them to even learn that they could outspeed the Soviet fighters they faced, and that says very little for the Japanese ability to exercise ingenuity. When the Fiats were replaced by the Ki-21, later known to the Allies as the Sally, it was welcome because at least this was something to which the Japanese were accustomed. The Sally had a range of over 1,200 miles, she cruised at 240 miles an hour, she had a maximum speed of about 280 miles an hour in ideal conditions, and although she could only carry 2,200 pounds of ordnance, she could penetrate Chinese, Mongolian, and Soviet airspace under escort. On the northern front, however, she was hindered by a top speed below that of the Polykorpov I-153 and I-16, both of which had seen service in Mongolia and in Spain, and were well understood to intelligence to be filling out the ranks of the Soviet VVS and the Chinese Air Force. It was largely the fault of inefficient power plants and fuel consumption in early marks, as well as the high altitudes in western China, that really kept the Sally back from achieving her goals. This was only made worse by a defensive armament that was lacking in both quantity and field of fire. She had way too many blind spots and carried not enough guns and not enough ammunition for those guns. Although 1940 would bring in a major change to the Sally with a new variant that included a rubber-lined semi-self-sealing fuel tank that was installed where the Zippo lighter-inspired previous version was, it also saw her defensive armament being strengthened and her range extended to over 1,600 miles. However, she could still barely reach 300 miles an hour, and her ordnance was only increased by 440 pounds of drag-increasing externally mounted bombs. Instead of improving her, she actually became more of a sitting duck to Soviet and Chinese fighters. Commonwealth and American planes later would make short work of Sally's throughout the war. While the Japanese Navy would be famously advanced by the time of Pearl Harbor, or at least allegedly famously advanced, even her upgraded clods could not help the Navy stave off tremendous losses at the start of the conflict. In the campaign of August to November 1937, when the G-3M Nell bomber was introduced, the Navy flew from Taipei in Japanese Formosa and Jeju Island in Japanese Korea with the goal of terror bombing. 43 Nels and 7 Hiro G2H1s took off with a dozen escorts, both old A4Ns and newer A5M Claudes, to bomb Hangzhou and Quante, foretelling the strategic bombing of key coastal cities as well as airfields and centers of production deeper into China for which the Japanese would become well known. As the Japanese continued this trend of attacks throughout their engagement in China, the Nell continued to fight despite her slow speed of 230 miles an hour max and 170 cruising, and her light ordnance load of only 1,800 pounds, the Nell would be the key aircraft striking horror into cities like Chongqing, Shanghai, Nanking, and countless others. Supported by the antiquated B-2M torpedo biplanes and flying from captured coastal bases and carriers, always with escort, the Navy still lost dozens of bombers to Chinese Hawk biplanes and P-26s. Despite the cost, the Japanese forces pressed their attacks, and the Navy did outperform the Army in most every way. And for her time, the Nell was an excellent aircraft, just not over China or without improved escorts as the Zero would come to be. Just ask the Royal Navy about that. Or don't. The sheer size of China worked against the Japanese bombing campaigns that demanded careful fuel management on the part of the Japanese while Chinese fighters could wait to pounce on the escorts and their charges, in theory at least. Chinese aircraft were vastly outnumbered. Pilots lacked training, and fuel could not be spared on constant patrolling. As for the Japanese, using the bombers' top speeds could help them escape interceptors, but with a combat load, they were just ducks in a shooting gallery. The inclusion of NATO escorts barely helped as they could, as I just mentioned, barely reached 280 miles per hour at altitude and cruised at 220 miles an hour. 20 miles an hour slower than the Sally's cruising speed. 
and you can compare the performance, the optimal performance, I should note, of aircraft in use here. Now, both the Japanese and the Chinese were notoriously inept at uh, aircraft maintenance, and especially engine maintenance, in newer models of aircraft. And the weather in China is unholy at best. So let's just consider this to be optimal performance, and you can make adjustments mentally as you wish. The Nate was barely adequate. The Claude was even slower. The Japanese were raiding deep into China and being torn apart by the Hawk biplanes that were now giving way to hundreds of Polycarpov I-16s and I-153s, together with dozens of modern Model 75M Hawks, a simplified version of the P-36. And on top of that, the Hawk 2s and 3s were still around, plus about three dozen Gloucester Gladiators and sparse handfuls of Devotin D-510s, Fiat CR-32s, and Boeing P-26P shooters. The Chinese didn't have a lot of fighters, but they did know how to use them, when they had the fuel and when they had the opportunity. Over Mongolia, central China, and south China, Japanese army bombers began to keep closer to the front and only fly when sufficient escort was available. They saved on fuel as best they could while flying ahead of the bombers in hopes of jumping intercepting Chinese and Soviet fighters as they attempted to climb to altitude, or to catch the fighters loitering in wait to power dive on Japanese bombers and cutting them off before they could. Before the introduction of the Mitsubishi G4M Betty Bomber and A6M Zeke Fighter on 13 September 1940 by the Japanese Navy, and the Army's first fielding of the Ki-43 Oscar in October 1941, the speed and range of Japanese bombers and fighters cost the invader dearly. Chinese fighters were increasingly of the Polycarpov models, which could reach 304 miles an hour in the case of the I-16, and they had a steady supply of parts and fuel from the Soviet Union. For the first time, China was able to keep their fighters well-prepared, well-maintained, and of a modern standard. They could engage and disengage at will for the first time and outpace the Japanese bombers whose ranges now brought them beyond the limits of their fighter escorts. The vastness of China and the proximity of the Japanese bases to the front lines meant that there was little warning for the Chinese Air Force to act on, and the Japanese could still act with impunity and terrorize Chinese cities at will. By 1939, the massive supply issues faced by China, even with the Soviet supplies and volunteer fighter pilots that they had had in 1938, were making the air war nearly unwinnable. On a side note, the Soviet Volunteer Air Force had first seen combat on 21st November 1937, and involved over 2,000 voluntolds from the USSR operating from within China, even outside of Xinjiang, which was a practical Soviet puppet at the time, fighting with the full cooperation of KMT forces and with Claire Chenault's leadership. Mao would not have an air force of any real kind until the Chinese Civil War. So to be clear, the Soviet Volunteer Group, this, uh, the Soviet Volunteer Air Force, was acting in coordination with and under the command of Chiang Kai-shek's Air Force. Now, the Red Chinese even produced a pretty good documentary on this, if you care to look it up. Uh, it included some pilots and crewmen who were members. And funny enough, whereas films from the Republic of China, like Heroes of the Eastern Skies, include Polycarpov I-16s in their scenes, no mention is made of the USSR. Uh, films from Red China do mention the Flying Tigers, but also focus on how important Soviet aid was. Although recent productions like Eastern Battlefield, which I watched all 43 episodes to garner any good footage when I was making this video, uh, mentioned the Flying Tigers only in passing, uh, so as to glorify Mao instead. And, uh, and this is where a lot of my effort was spent in this video, and I really hope you enjoy what I was able to find, because there really isn't a lot out there that's visually entertaining in any way. It just doesn't exist. But if you want to check those out, um, I will put links to them in the comments. The only point in common between the Republic of Chinese films and the Red Chinese films is the discussion of these overseas Chinese pilots I mentioned. In fact, before the American Volunteer Group, there were aces from amongst returning overseas Chinese who had pilot's licenses in America or in the Commonwealth, and there was the Soviet Volunteer Group. And for that, I do recommend uh, The Red Eagle in Chinese People's War of Resistance Against Japan, or it also seems to be called The Legend of Flying Eagles in the Anti-Japanese War, 
Uh, it's available on YouTube with English subtitles, so you could watch it without supporting Peking. But the only thing is, is that, I mean, I speak Chinese pretty okay. I understand a lot more than I could ever speak. And the subtitles are awkward, but it is educational and I did enjoy it. So just, just take with a grain of salt about the size of the Kremlin. All the talk about the Soviets sending pilots to help bring about justice, peace, in the Stalinist way. You've been warned. If you check out Eastern Battlefields, you have more free time than I do, I'll tell you that. But there are some good episodes if you already know the history and can ignore awkward dubbing in every language for every character. And the Maoist double-plus good history straight from the Ministry of Truth and the Ministry of Love just for you. Moving on. Now, the Chinese were able to hit Japan where it hurt, albeit only in small raids. They started a transportation war of sorts by launching strikes against railways and harbor facilities in Japanese zones, stemming the Japanese drive on Chongqing. The Japanese, as a nation, were low on petroleum and severely lacking in motor tea. Striking railways and river shipping with bomb-laden fighters and bombers of all types, including Volti A-19s, Northrop Gammas, plus Soviet medium bombers like the Tupolev SB, later supplanted by the Tupolev uh, DB-3, strikes on Shanghai, the Yangtze, and Yellow Rivers, the ports lining the Taiwan Strait, and railway lines weaving through the Chinese countryside to facilities and cities the Chinese knew intimately, all came with a high butcher's bill. But China was not out of the fight. The Soviets even led a handful of strikes against Japanese bases in Formosa itself. The Chinese were relentless, if only out of desperation. And while I don't want to get into it here, uh, there is actually a very interesting raid over Japan using Martin B-10 bombers. So always something if you want an interesting read, and maybe I'll do an episode on that one day. But to get back to the real war on the mainland, as I mentioned, space was a concern for the Chinese as much as for the Japanese. And the aftermath of the warlord period took away much of China's greatest natural resource the land. So where the Japanese had to face a long front, far from their homes, with challenging transportation problems, the Chinese couldn't even count on their own territory. While a map of Japanese occupied China in 1938-1939, like this one from the West Point Department of History, may leave it looking like China had a massive hinterland available for retreat, the country was hardly stable at the time Japan invaded and the civil war was merely interrupted by the Japanese conflicts. Mao and Chang only agreed to fight the Japanese for usurping the Chinese tradition of being killed by their fellow Chinese. In addition, geography was against the Chinese. Tibet's inhospitable region was largely unavailable and superfluous to China's industrial and defense needs. Xinjiang, as I mentioned, was practically in the hands of the USSR. Mongolia was hardline Stalinist and the independent desk Tanu Tufa was basically the Soviet Union in all but name. Japan controlled China through puppet governments like the Reformed Government, Provisional Government, Inter-Mongolian, and Manchugol administrations. Luckily, the Manchus, Mongols, and the coastal Han communities were, for the large part, the only ones where Quislings could be found, and the Japanese attempt to woo the Muslim Hui Chinese backfired spectacularly creating instead a unified Muslim coalition as dedicated to the eradication of the sons of Yamato as to the destruction of communism. Small pockets of largely communist resistance broke up the Japanese-controlled areas, and bandits were always a problem. Although those bandits were sometimes Japanese puppet forces, sometimes the Japanese puppet forces were the bandits. Rays of the Rising Sun is a great book if you want to read that, all about Japanese allies, focusing on the puppet governments. Regardless, there was little role for these irregulars in supporting the air war. All they did was interrupt supplies and make fighting the war difficult. Nationalist China, meanwhile, controlled an area from the Fuken and Canton coast inland to the capital at Chongqing and Sichuan. Across the Daba Mountains, the communist, nationalist, and nationalist-affiliated units from the Ma clique fought against the Japanese advancing through Inner Mongolia, whilst to the west, Warlords, holding tenuous alliances at best with the KMT, were in control. The ability to exploit natural resources and conduct coordinated defensive planning was really just not there. And the actual area of China left to the government and over which the Chinese Air Force fought for control 
was relatively small, barely the size of New Guinea. Primary air bases during this time were mostly within a 30-mile radius of Chungking for defending the capital, at Nansfing and Shaoquan in northern Canton to counter the naval air offensive and the blockade of Fukien and Canton, at Kunming in Yunnan, Taiping Sea Air Base and the satellite bases in Chengdu, and before the infamous fall of Nanking, the air base at Kuyong, uh, which is also called Jurong, on the outskirts of Nanking. China's only advantage was that Japanese observation and early warning were some of the worst in the world, and their wireless technology wasn't really far behind that in ranking. With the Japanese pressing on every side against Chinese industry and logistics, China found herself in a desperate situation that was growing more desperate every day. Whilst Chinese fighters could meet the nimble escorts and vulnerable bombers overhead, the Japanese had the advantage of altitude and surprise. Chinese early warning systems, while better than the Japanese, were largely based on civilian observers spread out throughout the countryside. As effective as it was, the disorganization and chaos of Japan's Navy's terror bombing of Chinese cities in the south and her army's land campaigns and bombing of infrastructure, industry, and centers of command and control were taking a toll on the Chinese ability to conduct war at any level. The only resources left to the Chinese were their immense population, their tenacity, and political connections to the West. At the heart of helping China overcome the indefatigable threats of Nels and Sally's was Curtis. Hawk 75s were coming out of factories in America and Pauli's factories in China. Unique among the foreign allies during the war, not everything had to be shipped across the ocean. Funding for the Chinese Air Force was coming through more streams, licit, illicit, covert, and overt, than those that combine into the Yangtze, in what has been called the first major proxy war of the century. By 1939, FDR had even agreed to supply American pilots in Chinese uniform to fight Japan. But they, like the fighters they were to fly, would take time to arrive, and time was something China simply did not have. Chinese fighter squadrons may have been growing in number and were often able to meet the Japanese and win, but they were flying general pursuit aircraft who needed time to fly to reach high-flying bombers, and the Japanese were often intercepted only after having dropped their payloads, when they were also faster and able to exchange altitude for speed on their way back to their bases. China could not afford the resources to maintain combat air patrols that soaked up fuel and were inefficient against Japanese raids over such a large front. Chinese fighters were particularly vulnerable while climbing to altitude, and in close combat with the much lighter, more nimble Japanese fighters, manned by highly trained, highly disciplined pilots. With their current infantry missing the mark, few facilities, and a largely unskilled and uneducated population, and nearly no purchase power on the world market, it was time for Curtis Wright and Bill Pauley to come to the aid of a beleaguered China, and they knew exactly what China was missing an interceptor. Now, an interceptor wasn't missing just in China. It was missing everywhere. But why? To understand the CW-21's uniqueness and to see why she was kind of a groundbreaker despite an abysmal operational history, one has first to see why there was no interest in an entire class of aircraft. What exactly makes an interceptor was something that was kind of known. It just hadn't been truly developed. You couldn't just go into the manufacturers and say, one interceptor, please, that'll be for takeaway. Power plants were not capable of providing monoplane fighters with the kind of thrust needed to generate the lift necessary to achieve the desired time to altitude, and pursued aircraft were defined in a vastly different way than they would be by the time the next war would end. In the Great War, triplanes offered the best lift, but they were heavy and slow once at altitude compared with biplanes thanks to the extra drag, although they were extremely maneuverable. Even triplanes only achieved climb rates of 900 feet a minute in the Sopwith triplane and 1,120 feet a minute in the Fokker DR-1, despite their light weight. Through the 20s and early 30s, interceptors were simply impractical thanks to the speed of bombers, limitations of fighter design, and lack of sufficient early warning systems. The advent of complex early warning systems that included observers with easy telephone or telegraph access, coordinated listening stations, and early types of radar, was just beginning to be seen as a possibility. Now, if we look at these requirements for an early warning system, 
the Chinese had at least the first two of these, radar, of course, being right out. Looking to Spain for an example of the time, a compact country split into a myriad different Soviet-supported and independent left-wing groups, fighting relatively organized nationalist and Carlist forces, an incoming raid could be a shocking surprise, and the threat of bombings rattled nerves on every side. Medium-altitude bombers and small flights inflicted a great deal of damage in the war in Spain, and they did so with minimal risk of interception. By the time a Heinkel HE-51 or a Polycarpov I-15 or I-16 got to altitude and actually found the bombers, the result was much the same as in China. They would arrive after the fact if they even found the enemy, with or without ground-based radio direction assistance. Experiences in Spain and in war game after war game in nation after nation proved large-scale attacks were confounding to ground-controlled interception planners, making point defense nearly impossible and general defense expensive and ineffective. Douay was being proven right, but largely because nobody was trying to build an aircraft to defeat the self-fulfilling prophecy of bombers always getting through. Even if fighters could easily climb 3,000 feet in a minute and overtake a bomber with a combat load, it just wasn't enough. In the war-torn 20s and 30s, fighter performance was limited by power plants, budgets, and a perception of futility brought on by the seemingly unlimited power of modern bombers. This is yet another reason the CW-21 is so absolutely unique. It really was the first time that a point-defense interceptor was designed with the intended purpose of achieving victory over enemy bombers with little advanced warning and saving the cost and fatigue of keeping combat air patrols in the air at all times. Meanwhile, bomber development saw the world go from ungainly biplanes with fixed undercarriages to medium bombers with ordnance loads greater than the weight of early 1920s bombers. The theoretical and intellectual oversight of the need for a dedicated, short-range interceptor was especially strong in the United States. Pursuit aircraft were general purpose. They were designed to be interceptors, dogfighters, patrol aircraft, strafers, and anything else they might have to be. On land, early warning against an enemy bomber fleet was seen as unnecessary. At sea, combat air patrols and scout planes were seen as sufficient enough to protect carriers in their principal job of supporting a battle fleet of battleships and cruisers. Through most of the 1930s, the idea of an airborne foreign threat to America was considered ridiculous in the first place, despite American interests abroad finding themselves under the shadow of up-and-coming aggressors. While the RAF and Luftwaffe were developing new modes of warfare built around state-of-the-art technology, the U.S. fell woefully behind. If anything, it would be saved in 1942 by the failure of Japan to keep up with the early warning systems and modern doctrine, but only barely behind the U.S. herself. America is a large nation with far-flung territories, but just as the fleets were largely kept in port to save on costly power projection exercises, air bases were few and far between, highly centralized, and poorly planned. In 1935, the Army boasted a mere three wings— Marchfield, California, Langley, Virginia, and Barksdale in the Louisiana were the only major bases with active units. The other nine continental installations were all home to schools and school-assigned operations squadrons, which were largely of the Reserve and the National Guard, or otherwise were home to understrength, underfunded, and understaffed observation and transport squadrons. As late as 1938, America's air bases numbered a mere 21, plus four air depots at Fairfield, Middletown, Sacramento, and San Antonio, and a smattering of about 40 administrative centers, reserve centers, and small airstrips on Army and National Guard bases that couldn't host a full operational unit. Air power projection outside of the 48 states was minimal, with air bases limited to the Philippines, Hawaii, and Panama. In terms of actual overseas strength, it was pitiful to say the least. Three squadrons were at Clark Field in the Philippines, five in Hawaii, of which three were observation and two pursuit, and seven squadrons were found in the Panama Canal Zone. Even with the greater number of fields, the Army waged war against the Congress to gain more aircraft, but always come up short. And, as I will get to in a bit, they did so while playing fast and loose with facts, especially in Senate hearings. Puerto Rico, for example, a locale necessary for effective control of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, didn't get an Army airfield until 1939, despite the Army's insistence that coastal defense was strictly within its purview. 
and it wasn't really fully staffed for another year. The Panama Canal, perhaps the most vulnerable American overseas asset in terms of contribution to defense, was protected by a handful of Boeing P-12Es until 1939, when they got Boeing P-26s. Likewise, Clark Field in the Philippines was assigned the Boeing P-12Es of the 3rd Pursuit Squadron until 1937, when they too were given the well-outdated P-Shooter. The 28th Bombardment Squadron at Clark and Nichols Field flew Keystone B-3 and B-4 bombers until 1937, when the B-10 arrived. The B-18 Bolo only arrived in 1941. One could only imagine what short work the Zero would make of a Boeing P-12E, a fighter designed in the late 20s, introduced into service in 1930, and removed from operational service in the continental United States by 1934. I wouldn't dream of what the Claude or Nate would do to a Keystone bomber. If the same principle of lex orandi, lex credendi could be translated to defense policy versus military deployment, it was clear the U.S. had given up hope on defending anything American overseas and had put its head in the sand regarding aerial threats to the continent. The army was playing a game of numbers for the newspapers and politicians, while the rest of the world was playing for keeps with their blood. The Army Air Corps, soon to be restructured as the Army Air Forces, was in desperate need of an upgrade in the late 1930s. But interceptors, in the true sense of the word, were simply not a part of the program. Units designated interceptor appeared in 1939, but were just like any other pursuit units in every way. Through the 30s, defensive planning against aircraft was anathema, and pursuit was seen as a purely offensive weapon, and to a ludicrous degree at that. In 1931, the Air Corps newsletter bragged about the use of radio in guiding interceptors. Using a Curtis Condor bomber that had flown beyond visual range, the Army practiced interception drills by radio. By that I mean they had the bomber radio its position, direction, and speed to a ground operator, who then forwarded that information to the pursued aircraft, who intercepted that very bomber. If you're wondering why that would be a bragging point, you're not alone. When the enemy tells you where he is, when he's coming, and by what route, That sounds just like real war to me. Yet this was what the army was doing. Likewise, in maneuvers in Hawaii that year, the observation squadrons were used to demonstrate how they could be used to spot incoming raids, as if there would not be enough for the vulnerable little planes to do in a time of war, and as if enemy pursuits would not make short work of them. I should note that this occurred in a war game simulating an attack on Pearl Harbor by a foreign force equipped with naval aviation assets like that would ever happen. The reality of the mid and late 30s were in stark contrast to the tactical school's change of position regarding Air Force pursuit employment theory, from one of purely reactive defense in 1933 to one of defensive pursuit aviation and offensive long-range bomber aviation in 1935 and 1936. However, this was only called offensive activity as this was how they preferred to interpret escorting bombers, patrolling friendly territory, and, perhaps, directed interception of enemy bombers. Over the course of the 1930s, the bomber mafia ensured that pursuit strategists and tacticians were put aside, and not much in the way of doctrinal development would change in the decade before Pearl Harbor. Writing in 1931, Clare Chenault, here in his Boeing P-12E in the early 30s, summarized the principles of pursuit aviation as Attainment of air supremacy depends on the success of the pursuit force. The primary function of pursuit is to gain air supremacy. The first objective of pursuit is to destroy the enemy pursuit. Success of pursuit depends upon equipment, selection, and training of pilots, numbers, tactics, and organization in units large enough to provide effective concentration of force. Chenault built on these ideas through the 20s and 30s while at the Air Corps Tactical School at Maxwell Field outside Montgomery, Alabama. Here I recommend the article. Stopping the Unstoppable, Douay, Mitchell, and Arnold versus Chenault and Defensive Pursuit by Frank Onier in the Fall 2011 issue of Air Power and Modern Conflict, and Chenault's Trapezers, How One Team Revived and Revolutionized Fighter Tactics by Jerome A. Ennels, published in the Spring 1994 issue of Air Power History. As early as 1920, Chenault saw that pursuit doctrine was ten varieties of wrong, and made worse and worse over time by a doctrine that saw the primary goals for the Air Corps as the creation of an independent Air Force focused on unescorted, 
high-altitude precision daylight bombing. Chenault studied Bulga and used his 19th fighter squadron as a testbed of his theories throughout the 1920s. He proved time and again that air superiority was a necessary antecedent of successful bomber operations, and interceptors were the key to successful air policy. In 1926 maneuvers, which you can see outlined in one of my earliest videos of things to come, the bomber units fell like flies to the pursuit squadrons led by General Mason Patrick and Edward M. Lewis. The men showed how effective strike bombing and organized interception could both be. The men on the losing side were those who would become the bomber mafia, and they would not forget their losses when they came to power in the 1930s. When Chenault failed to achieve his objectives leading fighter squadrons against bombers in the 1931 Air Corps maneuvers, he quickly knew it was because his point defense lacked an early warning system. The brand new Boeing P-12s more than outpaced the still new bombers in service, the Keystone LB-6, Keystone B-3A, and Curtis B-2 Condor, none of which were any faster or deadlier than the Hanley Page or Gota bombers of the Great War. However, without enough warning time, they could not reach altitude, organize, and intercept the bombers in time, just like Curtis would find to be the case in China in 1937. This is when we encounter one of those moments in time that changes everything, and yet went unnoticed at the time and goes unnoticed today. The 1933 Air Corps anti-aircraft maneuvers would be the catalyst to Chenault's Chinese career, to the growth of modern point defense interception, the birth of early warning networks of observers, spotters, and integrated communication systems, and as it relates to our topic here, the ideas and inspiration for what would culminate in the Curtis Wright Interceptor. In the 1933 Coast Artillery Corps Anti-Aircraft Regiments vs. Air Corps War Games, pursued aircraft were put on the side of the Coast Artillery and tasked with anti-bomber and anti-strike defense. Chenault led the 17th and 27th Pursuit Squadrons and the 325th Observation Squadron out of Bowman Field, Kentucky, in the test of the Army's anti-aircraft capabilities. He came prepared to address the fact no aircraft could rise to operational altitude quick enough to intercept the bombers on their own. This is in 1926 or 1931, and things have changed greatly in those years. While Keystone B-Series bombers made up most of Blue Forces and ranged in top speeds from 115 to 140 miles an hour, the Boeing YB-9 all-metal monoplane reached 160 miles an hour and operated at 18,000 feet. The advanced Douglas Y-1B-7 monoplane was also included in the exercises, and this was a metal construction parasol wing bomber that reached 180 miles an hour and was considered a technological marvel. General Arnold and his bomber buddies were going to prove their cause to a cash-strapped war department once and for all. Single-engine light bombers like the Curtis A-3 Falcon, known as the Curtis Helldiver in Marine and Navy Service, so check out my video on the birth of close air support if you want more on the F-8C, could outpace fighters as well. And they served as attack and observation for blue and as observation aircraft for red. Though not involved in the exercise, the Curtis A-8 strike was already flying and impressing people as a metal monoplane with a speed of over 180 miles an hour. Chenault's P-12Es flew at up to 180 miles an hour, but years of service meant that 160 was closer to the truth about their peak performance. As well, operational altitudes had risen over the years, taxing the aging biplane's ceiling. The rules didn't help either. He was forbidden to operate within the target area, forcing him to operate no closer than 25 miles from Fort Knox. Chenault had his task set out for him and the cards stacked against him by an Air Corps determined to prove that bombers were infallible and omnipotent. Chenault took advantage of the preparation period of the exercise and added a key element to his plans based on what he had learned in the 20s and in the 1931 exercises. Red's commanding officers, Brigadier General Julian Lindsay, commanding general of Fort Knox, and Colonel Daniel van Voorhees, commanding the 1st Cavalry Regiment, recently moved to Knox and equipped with armored cars, both approved of Chenault's ideas. Chenault integrated his plans with the Coast Artillery units at the heart of the exercise. These numbered 17 searchlights, several sound locator sets, anti-aircraft machine gun units, and four gun batteries from the Coast Artillery. Everything was within the determined miles of the target, and Chenault broke no rules. He merely improvised. 
it was going to show that point defense was indeed possible. Chenault decided to put modern telephony, telegraphy, and wireless technology to the test and established 16,000 square miles of early warning systems in Ohio and Kentucky. Thousands of miles of wire were hung connecting the entire defense network. Blue's goal was to attack Fort Knox, and every town and field on Red's side from the Ohio River to Louisville had observers and spotters. In addition to sound locators and other heavy equipment, Chenault stuck with keeping it simple. Telephone lines were hung in addition to existing civilian telephone networks. Switchboards were erected at each command center, and wireless voice and telegraph as well as portable and civilian telephony sets were used by signalers in the field. Observation aircraft equipped with wireless sets patrolled, and select fighters were equipped with voice radio receivers and paired with telegraphy-capable observation aircraft. You might say it was a perfect prototype for Chenault's China. Indeed, Chenault had created, indeed, Chenault had created the first fully integrated command and control air defense system. Now, the Air Corps expected to dominate the coast artillery in Chenault. By then, he was well known as the black sheep of the Air Corps. In fact, the black sheep of the army. Instead, Chenault intercepted and shot down the bombers time and time again even against the most modern bombers and against surprise attacks. 18 of 19 interceptions succeeded. The only failure was in a night interception done without searchlight or communications assistance. The technology was basic, and it worked. Whilst wired sets over a few hundred yards in length were seen as unnecessary in the after-action report, what was deemed more than sufficient to achieve the desired outcomes were wireless technology, the use of existing telephone lines, and equipping soldiers and observers with a roll of nickels for Ma Bell to take advantage of existing communications networks. It was a masterpiece, and it was all under the leadership of Chenault. Describing his applied concepts of observation, centralized fighter control, and directed interception, Chenault's after-action report, which was not included in the Army's report, demonstrated the extensive evidence he had collected and condensed his findings into two maxims. Pursuit could intercept bombardment if furnished timely information and if the defense had sufficient depth to allow for necessary time factors. And two, bombers flying deep into enemy territory required friendly escort to prevent heavy losses, if not utter failure. It was this experience and knowledge Chenault would later put to use in China. He had proved time and time again that communication was an effective cure to the allegedly all-powerful bomber. But a fighter was needed that could reach the bomber in time. Such point defense interceptors did not exist. But it was this that the CW-21 would come to embody. And Chenault had proven by 1934 that such a craft would be an asset to any air force, rather than the white elephant that the bomber mafia would make you think it was. Of course, Army High Command called out this logical development of command and control as outright cheating. But as our Lord said, no prophet is accepted in his own country. The Army claimed that since not every single bomber was downed every single time, they had won. The interceptor was seen as a pipe dream on the outskirts of popular opinion. The bomber had won, they ruled, and with the Martin B-10 entering service at the end of the next year, Successful interceptions by the P-12Es were seen as nothing more than a fluke, a last grasp at relevance, ignoring the fact that the P-26 was about to be deployed. Either way, they were not going to let Chenault get away with beating them fair and square, and Chenault was only going to become ever the more tenacious. And that was not a popular move. He wasn't being very political, and he wasn't the kind to be political. He was insistent on serving a buffet of crow to the Air Corps. In 1934, he published his classic text, The Role of Defensive Pursuit, wherein he built on his theory and flew in the face of Air Corps doctrine. Furthermore, he extrapolated, successful air defense consists of three phases of operations, detection and reporting, interception by pursuit, and the destruction or repulse of invaders by the combined action of all the weapons available to the defense. The book was actually a booklet at best, so if you see it called a book, it really isn't. It was compiled from Chenault's articles that had been published as a serial in the Coast Artillery Journal. 
The Air Corps newsletter wanted nothing to do with him, and the Army had insisted that intercepting bombers and protecting the coast was their goal. So leave it to Chenault to find a way to get his word out. After all, bomber interception and anti-aircraft units were under the coast artillery. As much as the Army didn't want to hear it, the coast artillery had been under three consecutive chiefs between 1933 and 1935, who each fought uphill battles, and who each were more than eager to add their weight to Chenault's fight against the Air Corps. Each wanted to prove that anti-aircraft and coast defense were the keys to the future, and the army was as against them as it was against Chenault. The two were natural allies. Chenault's articles and the coast artillery's reports of the maneuvers told the truth, and the facts of the matter were clear. The army's interpretation, however, was unanimous, and they described their findings as if they were obvious to everyone but Chenault. Bombers would fly in broad daylight, without escort, and succeed. In the Command and General Staff College list for 1934 and 1935, a name was now missing. Claire Chenault was no longer among that elite. To show how lasting the results of this persecution are, the Army's website today comments on how the maneuvers helped form bomber tactics that would be used in World War II, as it demonstrated that bombers could not operate without escort. Ninety years after the 1933 maneuvers on the Ohio-Kentucky line, the Army websites claim that the lessons learned about bombers' vulnerability were put to use in World War II totally glosses over the drama of the event, even acting as if Claire Chenault was lauded for his work. If it were true that those lessons were learned that way, thousands of airmen would not have been swatted out of the skies over occupied Europe flying unprotected over the Reich. I'll put the link to that page on the Army website in the description, by the way. There's unfortunately very little about the whole event, and it's kind of pathetic about our army and air force, if you ask me. Getting back to the point, though, Chenault was relentless in his conclusion that an early warning network and quick responding interceptors could down any incoming bomber force that did not have ample and capable escort. Chenault preached to any and all comers, even taking time during a trip to Atlanta with his demonstration team, to publicly comment in the newspaper about his belief that it was possible to intercept bombers and that the country, nay, mankind, was doomed if it believed otherwise. Now, on the Army's part, they had never seen the pursuit force as one that included short-range tactical interceptors operating over one owns territory. Since the Army never saw the Air Corps operating anywhere farther than the coastline, they meant it had no need for an interceptor at all. Every aircraft with an incredible climb rate had failed, and no support for an interceptor was to be found. The Boeing XP-9 was advanced and could climb 1,600 feet a minute, but was abandoned because it was just plain unsafe to land, and no further development was encouraged. Boeing's XP-15 could climb 1,800 feet a minute, but was abandoned after the prototype's prop failed. The Berliner Joyce two-seat P-16 had the supercharger removed in the production model, handicapping the craft's potential. Navy fighters, on the other hand, continued to have high climb rates, and the Navy was very interested in promoting new ideas. But the Army was barely interested in pursuit aircraft at all. They nixed plans that would have put the United States years ahead of the rest of the world. Army doctrine thought of air superiority in extroverted terms. It was a necessary factor over a small territory far from the continental United States, not something to be maintained over one's own skies. Thus, pursuit aircraft and bomber aircraft did not have to have overlapping purposes. In 1937, Air Corps instructional films portrayed pursuit units as hunters going out to destroy the enemy's air bases and suppress their pursuit potential, and suppress their pursuit potential, freed from defensive duties. They were paired with attack doctrine more than anything else. Escort duty could be done, but not with heavy bombers. Offensive sweeps, or as close escort for strike, attack, and reconnaissance missions as in the Great War, were seen as the role of the pursuit aircraft, and nothing else. The bomber was the be-all and end-all of the operational strength in protecting the coastline and destroying enemy centers of population and production. The United States was making the exact same mistakes the Japanese were learning that same year in China, and the Japanese were by then escorting their bombers without exception to save them from a Chinese air force that was once a butt of Japanese humor. General pursuit planes tasked with interception could, the muckety-mucks of the army said, 
loiter in wait, or be directed by radio to where they were needed with plenty of time to spare. Chenault winced at seeing his pursuit force reduced to this, but the bomber mafia were the ones running the show in the 1930s. Whilst in the throes of his battle against Arnold and other Douay disciples, Chenault called them out on their hypocritical approach to pursuit doctrine. After all, if pursuit aircraft were limited in range and performance, how could they ever make it to an enemy airbase? They were forced out of offensive action and rendered irrelevant for defensive action. When asked to provide answers to questions on pursuit for an upcoming conference in 1934, the letter Chenault wrote made this clear. Pursuit has no, quote, normal role in any phase of war. If war begins with long-range bombardment and with rival aerodromes beyond the radius of the action of pursuit, then the only role possible to pursuit is active defense. If war begins in the, quote, usual manner, the manner which may be called historically normal, pursuit will be employed both offensively and defensively. Chenault had to take what victories he could. He had allies in the aviation industry. The aviation industry somehow loved the plucky little pain in the butt. And in 1936, one year before he would be sent packing, Chenault, together with Curtis Wright and Seversky Aircraft Company, it wouldn't be a republic until September 1939, had succeeded in dogging the powers that be into adopting the Seversky P-35 and the Curtis P-36 against their wishes. Both the Army and Congress had felt that the Boeing P-26 P-shooter was too new, having only been adopted in 1933 and too modern to need replacing. To put this in perspective, and see how scary a thought this really is, remember that the BF-109, Hawker Hurricane, and Moraine Saunier MS-405 all flew a year prior to them, and the Spitfire had taken to the air in March of that year. America barely had an aircraft of that caliber on the drawing board. To say that America was in a bubble was to put it mildly. Chenault and his pursuit units continued to fight an uphill battle for funding, often working outside the army and going directly to the aircraft industry with their ideas. For Curtis's men like marketer Bill Pauley and designers like Don Berlin and George Page, this arrangement was lucrative and let them keep at the leading edge of design in a time when government contracts might only be for 100 to 250 aircraft. Things would not change very much between 1931 and 1939. In that year, just before the outbreak of hostilities, Hap Arnold would write that the Air Corps' role would include three considerations, all of which show little regard for advancements in pursued aircraft design and capability. In fact, he specifically mentioned the perceived futility of any attempt to stop an air attack. He wrote that initial air objectives of an enemy would be the air bases at Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Panama, and other exposed areas. Two, a well-led and determined air attack could not be stopped by the defenses, though serious losses might be inflicted. Three, it was the duty of the Air Corps to provide a powerful striking force and the necessary strategic bases so that an actual or potential enemy could be attacked at his bases before launching an air assault against the United States. Any chance to build a high-quality, world-class fighter was shot down right there in the second point. A well-led and determined air attack could not be stopped by defenses. So that was that. The army was basically asking, why even try? To rub salt into the wound, the third point made it clear that the army thought bombers were magic. And in 1939, that meant the B-10 and the B-18. The Air Board report of September 1939 that would influence policy leading up to the events of December 1941 not only failed to mention large-scale strategic bombing at all, Field Manual 1-5 stated long-range offensive penetrating strike groups were the key to overseas operations, while at home the pursuit forces and strike forces would work with reconnaissance and observation units to provide close-in air defense, but were not expected to act as a rapid response force to an enemy bomber force trying to penetrate American airspace. Pursuit and strike forces were supposed to have plenty of warning, and then stay aloft waiting for the enemy to converge on a known target. A surprise strike was just out of the American general staff's imagination, and both the inventory and the strategic positioning of American forces showed this. 
The effect that this had on aircraft designers designing the pursuit of the future was chilling to say the least. But did it lead to more bombers being sent overseas to actually carry out these attack plans? Also no. In fact, I took the time to read through the Senate and House hearings on military proficiency, expenditure, priorities, performance, etc., 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 all through the years of the late 30s. And there's a lot of them. No mention of an early warning for an inbound raid is made in any of them. The Panama Canal's vulnerability to air attack is explicitly mentioned by congressmen. The need for a balance of aircraft types is stressed for hours and hours in testimony. And yet it was all based on figures from 11th of November 1918. The concept of interception by pursued aircraft is mentioned only once. And it is in reference to why aircraft are needed in Puerto Rico, Alaska, and the Northeast to intercept an enemy fleet and warn the ground forces of what's coming. In April 1939, it was finally announced that the Army, the very force that said coastal patrol and interception was completely within its domain, might think to put airfields at some of the most vulnerable points in the world, the very ones listed as being vulnerable years before, by the Army. Now, the Philippines had Clark, Nichols, and other smaller airfields since the birth of the Air Service, and the 4th Composite Group was there as well as the nascent Philippine Constabulary Air Corps. However, it was notoriously under-equipped, underfunded, the last to receive aircraft, and at least two generations behind the rest of the Air Corps on a good day. This Mickey Mouse nonsense would simply not cut it against a very motivated, very modern, experienced enemy, and the army had tried nothing and was all out of ideas. Remember that at this time the Americans saw the Japanese as being incapable of original thought and perceived Japanese aviation tech to be at least a decade behind and entirely either foreign-derived or foreign-inspired. Despite all evidence to the contrary being blatantly obvious to anyone who cared to look, like Curtis was certainly looking, Nobody in the Army Air Corps thought that the Japanese had the capacity to strike at American targets with any serious force. Even if those same Japanese were waging a very modern conflict in China, with a very active air war, with very new machines, in large quantities, with highly trained crews, and they were just a hop, skip, and a Taiwan away. It was years of a three-way fight between the Air Corps trying to cover their tailpipe as best they could while both begging Congress for money, while simultaneously claiming to have America's defense needs solved for the foreseeable future, all while the press pushed for more investment in national defense to calm the fears... to calm the public's fear of another European war, and to create much-needed jobs in the defense industry. When it did break out, The war in Europe was described as one between pursued aircraft, and America's strength is in having superior fighters and the best bomber in the world. At the same hearing in 1940, the same generals declared pursued aircraft have a lifespan of four to seven years, and then they could be used for training if enemy progress forces one's hand to develop newer machines before then. The P-26 Peace Shooter in 1940 was vaunted as still being useful, especially in training. If only that were true, the Army still had them in active pursuit units, not training units. Luckily for the Army, the Senate didn't know that. The Senate and the House grilled the Air Corps in session after session about America's ability to defend herself, and the Army just shoveled more and more into the pile of chutzpah that they'd started. When it came to interceptors and protecting America from airstrikes, The Air Force darted around the question as much as possible, and the press took notice. It's so much political drivel in so many ways and so behind the times that the only person to see that much talking out of that particular orifice must be a politician or a proctologist. In this case, in this case, it was an Air Corps talking out of both sides of their mouth about the dire need for money and their delusional claims to have both mastery of the skies and a position at the forefront of aviation technology. In terms of modernity and preparedness, the Air Corps was not in a good place, no matter what they told themselves or those in government. 
Saversky's P-35s were already outpaced when introduced in 1938 and were plagued with issues. The P-26s and consolidated P-30 fighters were obsolete and largely out of service except in, ironically, America's most important posts in the Panama Canal and Philippines. The P-35's successor, the Republic P-43 Lancer, would not arrive until 1941. The Curtis P-36 Mohawk was already known to be underpowered and underarmed, and to have serious performance and maintenance handicaps in even the most advanced models. Though the Mohawk did still outperform its predecessors. These were all still considered good enough until the P-38, P-39, and P-40 could be fielded. This trio was part of the Air Corps' 1937 approach to pursued aircraft. A high-altitude twin-engine P-38 able to penetrate enemy airspace, a high-altitude single-engine P-39 general pursuit, and a medium-altitude P-40 general pursuit aircraft. Although the P-38 and the P-39 were termed interceptors in circular proposals X-608 and X-609, the term was included by authors Lieutenants Kelsey and Saville, of the Army Air Corps' Materiel Division, as the word had never been used before in American terminology, and it was a way around the limitations placed on pursuit aircraft of having to be only single-engined craft with no more than 500 pounds of ordnance, including the ammunition and the guns themselves. With the supercharger taken out of the P-39, the Air Corps saw itself as having a low, medium, and high-altitude set of general pursuit aircraft. But as far as they were concerned, there were no true interceptors or air superiority fighters. Interceptor was just a word used to get around things and placate both the public and a Congress who were growing ever more anxious about the threat of enemy bombers. Now, there were interceptors, real interceptors, asked for in 1938 and 1940, but none of them came to any fruition past the prototype stage. All of them were funded well after design competitions were initiated, and as an afterthought once the war had broken. I'll get to a list of some of those later, but the point remains that the Army Air Corps, or Army Air Forces as it would soon be, really had no interest in any of these. They were simply, these were merely designs that were asked for to determine the state of technology at the time, but there was never any idea that they would actually be adopted. One thing worth noting at this point is that this was kind of how the whole war went. The United States ended up going through to 1946 without an interceptor and paid for it dearly in late war kamikaze strikes, for which the Grumman Bearcat was specifically designed to counter. The Bearcat had a climb rate of just under 4,500 feet per minute, the same as the CW-21B. Until then, the best going was the chance-fought F4U Corsairs with a climb rate of 2,900 feet a minute, until the Dash 4 variant offered 4,300 feet per minute. And all of these were when empty and at war emergency power. What the Army did cook up in 1937 was this idea of a convoy fighter or a bomber destroyer. And I don't honestly think they knew what it was best called, but convoy fighter was both the most popular and the least appropriate appellation. And this was Bell's YFM-1 Aracuda. It was a strange design that was termed a bomber destroyer and intended to loiter for hours waiting to pounce on bomber formations with trainable cannon in each wing nacelle. The Aracuda was designed to tear apart inbound bombers before being outrun by them. Even bomber formations from the Soviet Union, as some comics theorized, in what was seen as a chance to keep some bombers from reaching their target, while also giving the idea ahead that these bombers would get through anyway and that there was no use in trying to outspeed them. For more details on late 30s heavy fighter trends, by the way, check out my Der Stuhl Vorwärts video. In general, however, not even a hint of a suggestion was made for a tactical interceptor for the continental United States, Philippines, Hawaii, or the Panama Canal. Despite many war games, especially by the Navy, but also by the Army, showing the vulnerability of these crucial outposts to surprise attack by naval aviation time and time again. And where the military was silent, the press was quite not. America's vulnerability was hardly a secret to the public, especially to a public focused on aviation in the news. Even a shortage of trousers in the Army Air Corps was noted in the press. Headlines resounded with tales of the war in Spain. Advertisements and government grants heralded the increase in commercial air travel. Newsreels showed the gruesome results of Japanese bombers in China, 
and Goebbels' media celebrated the Luftwaffe's shadow looming over those who dared challenge Germany's resurgence to take her place among and over nations, especially the recently gypped Czechoslovakia. Americans were deeply afraid of air raids, conscious of the need for protection, and they had the draft and civilian programs like the Civilian Pilot Training Program reinforcing the need to improve American defenses. But nothing in the halls of the Air Corps would seem to reflect this. Even the perpetually left-siding New York Times called out the Roosevelt administration's poor record on air defense, while China and Spain foretold the need for strong modern air forces, both in small articles and long articles adjacent ones excitingly telling of war games and defense spending. The world seemed to be under the knife of the bomber as Douay seemed to be proven right by the happenings in China, Africa, and Spain. The bomber seemed invincible. Curtis Wright disagreed. Chenault disagreed and the army played deaf, dumb, and blind to the matter. When the expansion plans finally reached an appropriate scale in 1939, it was primarily for bombers, although the facade of a balanced air force was maintained to please the Senate and to calm the public. A quick overview of the aircraft requested in 1939 is very telling. Trainers, multi-engine bombers, so-called interceptor pursuit aircraft, multi-place fighters, and observation aircraft were all requested. The trainers included a large order for an upgraded AT-6, as well as upgrades to monoplanes. Bombers requested led to the B-25, B-26, and B-29, with the consolidated B-32 Dominator as a contingency. In terms of pursuit aircraft, they were a mix of actual interceptors, like the Curtis Wright XP-55 Ascender, and notably odd designs from Northrop and Volte. For twin-motored interceptors, McDonald's Moonbat, Grumman's XP-50, which was a land-based take on the XF-5F Skyrocket, the Lockheed XP-58 Chain Lightning long-distance fighter, and the winning choice, the XP-49, which was another development of the P-38 and, again, was not a true interceptor. Of all of these pursuit designs, none would go beyond the prototype stage, and only the XP-55 and XP-50 were genuine interceptors of sound design. Multi-place fighters were all out, None was ever even selected. And this is a scene throughout the late 30s in an air corps to whom Curtis found herself trying to make sales of a light, short-range, limited-role interceptor, and where Claire Chenault was grateful not to find himself. The army was stuck in a right rut. Unfortunately for the rest of the world, America was not designing what was going to be sorely needed in Europe and was already missing in China. Chenault had not been around since 1937, after having more than worn out his welcome in the tumultuous late 30s battles over the role in construction of the Air Corps. He was persona non grata and found himself discharged from the army after being deemed unfit to fly. He was cancelled, as they might say today. In 1937, he went to China and joined the staff of Chiang Kai-shek and put his knowledge into practice, trading his uniform for that of the Chinese Air Force. He immediately set to work evaluating the Chinese Air Force, the Japanese strategies and tactics, and the resources he had available to him. He quickly decided to begin by finding a way to deny Japanese air superiority and thus open their bombers up to slaughter. He established communications networks, developed early warning protocols and procedures, and quickly created the largest observation force in the world, the entire Chinese population. The only thing missing was the perfect machine. Amongst his toiletries and a change of skivvies, Chenault took something else with him to China. An excellent relationship with the people at Curtis Wright. Between him and Bill Pauley, Curtis Wright knew what to do to save a Chinese Air Force on the very brink of collapse. Back in the States, and specifically inspired by the wars in Spain and China, Curtis's famed designer set to work. With Don Berlin dedicated to the P-36 and what would become the P-40, George Page bent his brain on designing an affordable interceptor that could be shipped overseas easily, undergo final assembly in simple facilities by semi-skilled labor, and meet the needs of a world seemingly under the shadow of the bomber. <laughs>